Hello, I'm Roland Mallinson. I head the brand protection uh, practice at Taylor Whistle in the UK, and I'm joined by my colleague Louise Popham. Uh, she is a professional supporter in our team, and, and we're going to uh, change topic uh, and cover the subject of brands, border enforcement and exhaustion. So this is essentially the soft IP side of things, uh, and we're going to be looking at some uh, implications of Brexit. Uh, and also a consultation that's just launched, which I think is going to be of highly uh, great relevance to uh, this industry sector. Um, so uh, straight into uh, what we're covering. Um, let's move on. These slides working. So um, brands for many of you will be uh, names, essentially. You'll, you'll expect it will cover uh, trademarks and names. Uh, but in the pharma sector, uh, it, it has a high relevance as well in other areas that go beyond names. Uh, and many of you on the call, uh, your uh, companies will have registrations that go well beyond names, uh, and some of them might even feature on this slide here. So we've just done some examples to, to make it clear how uh, brands in particular can be of partic you know, real help in this, in this sector. They add... Uh, considerably to the uh, otherwise limited protection that one gets from patents uh, well beyond and can indeed it can last forever. Uh, I, some time ago, I used to act on registered trademark number one for the UK, which was registered in the 1870s sometime. It's a red triangle relating to beer. Uh, and, uh, and it just shows that uh, these rights can be incredibly valuable if secured and enforceable. The examples you see here, um, Sterry Hand is a, is a, is a product uh, design. You can see they're registered as a trademark. The Pfizer uh, tablet is registered as a trademark, showing in three-dimensional shape there. You've got inhalers uh, for um, and a Reckitt Benkisa air freshener. These sorts of rights, once if secured, can be immensely valuable uh, and strong. And as I say, provide with protection that goes well beyond the duration of a patent or indeed a registered design, which may only last 20 years. Uh, unregistered rights can last between three and 10 years, depending on the jurisdiction. But uh, these trademark rights, uh, once secured, can be highly valuable. It, it's interesting, perhaps, to look at the numbers involved, though, that are uh, going beyond pure names. Uh, in, the, in class five, which is the relevant uh, class for ph pharmaceutical products, uh, we've only got actually 300 or so that are three-dimensional marks that have been successfully registered. Many do fail and are, are not accepted for registration because they do grant a monopoly right on that shape. Uh, but device marks are registered um, in greater numbers. Uh, overall in the class five, there are only 134,000 uh, registered at the EU level. But on the right of the screen there, you'll see some examples that go even beyond shapes where you're having uh, particular colors registered um, uh, so you have Eli uh, Lilly's yellow and green there. Uh, indeed, I've been acting for another yellow and green in relation to tractors for many years. Uh, and, and these can be very strong and valuable rights. The color purple you'll see there uh, was an attempt to register and secure a monopoly on that color, which, it, which was rejected in relation to GSK's inhalers. Uh, and as you can see, there are a number of registrations for uh, designs that are recorded uh, on the system there in, in the relevant classes for medical devices. So uh, the, the, just to put some perspective on what you're next going to hear now from Louise, where she'll be explaining the impact that Brexit has had on some of these, uh, these rights. So I'll hand over to Louise uh, now. I think you need to take control, Louise. If you wish. Thank you, Roland. I've just requested control. There you go. Now that. OK. And then see if I can move the slide on. Um, at the moment, that's not letting me move the slide on. I don't know if How you about can that? Still... Oh, that works. Thank you. Okay. So um, as um, as Roland says, um, trademarks and designs can be incredibly important to the pharma sector. And, and I suppose unlike patents, where there's no pan-EU patent, um, there is, it is possible to get a pan-EU trademark and pan-EU design, both in registered and unregistered forms. So these are unitary rights, so you file one application uh, and they cover the whole of the EU. But um, with, with Brexit, um, from 1st of January this year, these pan-EU rights ceased to cover the UK. 
So they now cover the remaining 27 EU member states only. Uh, but fortunately, the UK government agreed to separately protect um, these rights uh, in the UK. And, and that was set out in the withdrawal agreement um, that the UK and EU entered into um, some time ago. Ronan, could you ping on the slide if you're if you still? Thank you. So this slide illustrates exactly what the UK has done to plug that gap. Um, it focuses on trademarks, but the position is largely the same for designs. So for every EU trademark registration that was in existence at the end of the transition period, which was 31st of December last year, um, the UK government created a new national UK registration called a comparable UK trademark. You, you might also have heard it called a cloned UK um, trademark registration. It's the same thing. Um, these new comparable UK trademarks were created automatically and for free. So they just sprung into existence on 1st of January um, this year. Um, they have the same priority filing and renewal dates as the um, EU trademark registrations from which um, they derived. Um, so nothing changes in terms of those dates or renewal dates, but obviously now they are separate rights, so they do need to be renewed separately from the parent EU trademark. Um, no registration certificates have, have been issued, but uh, if you want to uh, have a look at these rights, um, then details are obviously on the UK Intellectual Property Office database. Position slightly different for any um, EU trademarks that were pending at the end of last year. So if UK protection is required, you, you have to file a separate ap application here um, for that mark. Uh, an application doesn't automatically spring into existence. You have to positively file it. Um, but if the new application is filed by um, 30th of September this year, then it can claim the same priority and filing date as the corresponding EU trademark application. So this 30th September date is quite important to remember. And I think what we're going to see as 30th September approaches is a number of UK applications being, being filed so that the applicants can backdate those rights uh, and claim the same date as the corresponding EU trademark. Um, it does mean that you're going to get a lot of EU trademarks springing into existence that have very old um, dates. So let you know, take the example of a an EU trademark that perhaps was filed back in 2017 or, or even earlier perhaps, but perhaps it's hit hurdles or has been opposed such that it was still pending at the end of last year. Um, the owner of that EU trademark can now refile for the same mark in the UK and claim that 2017 date. So 30 September important to, re to remember. Um, if you file in the UK, um, the usual UK filing fees will apply and the refiled application will be examined afresh. So uh, it can be opposed all over again. Any objections can be raised again. The fact that any objections or oppositions may already have been dealt with for the EU trademark will be irrelevant. Um, it will be dealt with in the same way as any other um, UK application. Next slide, please. Thank you. So whilst that might seem relatively straightforward, the implications of this splitting out uh, of the EU right are quite significant. And um, we've produced a, a checklist briefly setting out all of the things that brand owners might want to think about um, doing as a result. And, and we'll make sure that's available to, to anyone who wants it after today's talk. But we just try to pull out five key issues here that you might want to think about. So first, fairly straightforwardly, um, you'll need to obviously um, update any internal records you have to, to reflect these new comparable UK rights. Um, as I said, details will be on the UK IPO database and uh, Taylor Wessing's database if we manage those rights for you. But if you have any of your own records, then you, you should be updating those to, to reflect these new UK rights. Secondly, importantly, um, if you had any EU trademarks that were pending on 31st of December last year, remember that 30th September date. Reapply in the UK if you want a UK trademark and then you get to backdate it. Um, and ideally, those UK applications should be filed well ahead of that 30th September deadline. Um, if you file right up against the deadline and there are problems with the application, um, you might not be able to correct it in time. As I said, we're expecting a lot of applications to be filed um, at that time. So the UK IPO uh, probably won't be as quick to spot problems as it otherwise would be. So do, do get your applications in as early as you can. 
Uh, relatedly, you might want to set up a watch to see if any third parties refile EU trademarks in the UK, perhaps particularly if you've opposed any EU trademark applications and you would want to oppose any refiled UK application, you ought to be watching for those. Um, we are expecting that some bogus applications will be filed in the UK around that 30th September date. So at, at times like this, you, you often get uh, kind of dubious, I guess, third parties trying to capitalise on this type of opportunity. And so they may well seek to register in the UK a mark that has been registered at or, or was applied for at EU level. So it's well worth making sure that you watch um, to see if any third parties are, are applying for any of your key marks. Um, and then you can take appropriate action if you spot any. It's also worth being alive to the risk of any bogus invoices. Uh, again, at times like this, you do see scams popping up. And just remember that the UK Intellectual Property Office um, only ever send correspondence to uh, an, an applicant's legal representative, um, not the applicant itself, unless it's managing its own applications and registrations. So if you receive any letters or invoices purporting to be from the UK IPO or, or anyone else, please um, View them with with caution and, and obviously ask your legal representatives if you're unsure whether they're genuine or not. Um, fourthly, um, we recommend that if you have um, granted or, or received any licenses over EU trademarks or given any security interests over EU trademarks, you record those separately against the, these new comparable UK uh, rights. That won't happen automatically. There's no porting across of that kind of data from the EU IPO to the UK IPO. So you will need to separately record those transactions in the UK. And that obviously will be particularly important if you're the um, licensee. So you get all of the rights attaching to that. Um, but you may may have an obligation um, to record it um, if you've given security um, as well. Um, lastly, um, Disputes involving EU rights are, are heavily impacted by all of this, uh, and it's probably too much to go into the detail on that now, but it's just well worth discussing any disputes involving pan-EU rights um, that were pending um, and already underfoot at the end of last year, just to see whether there are any implications. Your, your, your legal representative should, should already have been um, discussing that with you, but it's well worth just, just asking the question uh, whether Brexit has any implications for you. Uh, and of course, um, some of your agreements will will need to be amended to reflect the fact that there are now these two separate rights in the EU and UK, and that the UK and EU are separate territories with, with now separate laws and so on. Um, there might also need to be changes to the governing law and jurisdiction clauses in some of your agreements. So it's well worth looking through your key agreements and precedents just to see how that is, um, uh, how they can be amended. So that's a, a brief look at some of the issues from the trademark side. The position is largely the same for, for registered and unregistered designs, so we won't go into the de detail on, on that now. Next slide, please. And next one again. Thank you. So what about border in, enforcement? So uh, as you might know, IP owners can file something called an application for action, um, known as a, a, an AFA with, with customs. And these AFAs um, allow customs to seize goods potentially infringing IP rights um, at the borders on, on your behalf. Uh, and there's an EU-wide EU system for filing these AFAs. Um, so an AFA could be filed through any EU member state um, through their customs office and you can designate some or all of the other EU member states and anyone designated will then take action accordingly and watch for infringing goods uh, and, and notify you as appropriate. Um, some of you may well have done this uh, last year. You may have filed an AFA through UK Customs and, and, and asked that some or all of the 27 EU member states take action. Um, but bear in mind that those AFAs will now be confined to the UK only. They won't, um, th even if you designated any of the 27 EU member states, they won't now be taking action. Um, so if you wish to have um, an AFA in place in any of those 27 EU member states, you'll need to refile. Um, you should look to do that now rather than waiting for, for renewal if you, want, if you want action to be taken. And that uh, refiling process needs to occur through one of the 27 EU member states customs office. You can't do it through the UK anymore. 
So otherwise, it's largely business as usual for border um, enforcement. Um, the UK government has has made the EU customs regulation, which which governs all this, um, part of UK law. Um, it has amended it accordingly so that it applies now just to the UK. But as far as the processes and procedures are concerned, um, it, it's exactly the same. No, nothing has changed. So um, um, business as usual, really, in terms of, of border enforcement. So with that, I'll, I'll hand you back to Roland, who is going to talk about exhaustion of rights. Thank you, Louise. Um, so exhaustion of rights, possibly more important to the pharmaceutical sector than any other sector um, uh, that uh, we're dealing with in, in, uh, on this legal issue. Just to clarify what exhaustion of rights uh, means, for those perhaps less familiar with it, it essentially means that whilst you may have intellectual property rights to enforce against um, those using the rights in a, in a jurisdiction without consent, uh, that comes with a limitation. And a particular limitation applies where the goods have been put on the market by the, the IP right holder in another jurisdiction. So not an illegal trade. It was put on with your consent, with the consent of the IP right holder. And a third party, a parallel importer, is um, buying it from that jurisdiction, uh, uh, exporting it, and then importing it into a new jurisdiction where you have rights that you would otherwise be able to enforce, but because of the exhaustion and rights principle, you can't. It, it said uh, there that the rights have exhausted, uh, and uh, the idea is to allow a free movement of goods. And of course, this applies most obviously within the European Union, uh, but it can happen in many other jurisdictions. Some have regimes where once the goods have been put, placed on the market anywhere in the world, then they can be imported into the jurisdiction, even if the rights ho holder doesn't consent. That's the concept of international exhaustion. Equally, you could have national exhaustion where uh, there is no exhaustion unless and until the goods have been sold with the consent of the IP rights holder in that country alone. Uh, and this is something I'll come on to because there's a debate to be had now in the UK as to what regime we apply. Now, in, in the EU, what's been uh, existing to date uh, and still does is the concept of a fortress Europe. So um, the, uh, the uh, and the rising under the trademarks directive and regulation, in particular, Article 15 of those th those uh, statutes, um, there is a. Uh, a permission that says you can, uh, though, import into another country, even from outside the EEA, um, if there are um, uh, if there is consent or uh, there are legitimate reasons uh, to to um, sorry legitimate reasons for the importer to import them. So so you can have a, you can end up with a situation where goods are put on the market in say France. They can be purchased in France and exported to Germany, and that can that is an entirely free movement uh, allowed under the regime. What can though be stopped is if the goods have been bought in France and exported to Germany, and there's uh, and there's been a change to the condition of the goods, for example, and that gives rise to one of the potential legitimate reasons that the IP rights owner in Germany could enforce their rights in Germany to stop that movement of goods from France. So this. It, it, the exhaustion regime comes with a carve out, which is this idea and concept of legitimate reasons you'll see here on the right. Uh, and these are enshrined in um, the trademark uh, regulation and, and directive and effectively are reflecting uh, elements of uh, the treaty of the functioning of the EU, Article 34, which is um, free movement of goods. But there is this exception where there are legitimate reasons. And um, where, where we have this concept in trademark and design law in particular, for example, then uh, it has been very much the situation that case law has been evolving to uh, define and um, refine what are the legitimate reasons allowing these parallel imports. And some of that has given rise to areas of uh, confusion and certainly an awful lot of case law concern. So what we have now uh, since Brexit is that with the UK now no longer being in the European Union or the U and the EEA, uh, we have a temporary fix that's been put in place. So we have now at the moment a continued arrangement in the UK of EEA wide exhaustion, much as it was before, uh, as regards goods being imported into the UK. The difference is that now goods from 
uh, first put on the market in the UK cannot be moved into the EEA without the consent of the IP uh, right holder um, if they're going from the UK into the EEA, so UK across the channel to France. The, the exhaustion uh, principle still applies, though, of legitimate reasons that may allow enforcement in that scenario. But what we have, as I say, is, a, is an unreciprocated one-way exhaustion regime for the moment. It is a temporary uh, uh, situation, uh, and the UK government has a consultation that was launched only last week uh, on this topic, which we'll come on to in a, in a little more detail momentarily. But there's been a lot of case law uh, in the, uh, the Court of Justice as to the, the concepts of exhaustion and then the limitations in the carve out that arise. So just to visualize this for you, our current scenario right now is we have a one way uh, exhaustion regime where goods can move from uh, the EU into the UK uh, freely, but they cannot move from the UK into the EU freely under the exhaustion regime. The consultation we have uh, right now, it's open until the 31st of August, uh, has mooted four potential uh, alternatives uh, to, to consider. And it is very much looking to industry to give input on this. And indeed, if any industry needs to focus on this uh, more than others, it's probably the pharmaceutical sector. This is not least, as many of you will know, that parallel imports is something that happens uh, considerably in this sector uh, as a result, particularly of uh, government price uh, setting in other jurisdictions uh, where they may be artificially lower than in the UK and also obviously because of um, currency fluctuations uh, gen generally. So in this um, consultation the UK government has suggested four alternatives. Um, there is actually a fifth which they haven't suggested and I'm going to mute uh, uh, just on the next slide. Um, and I'm exploring to see whether that might be viable. But the first one that they're looking at is simply uh, keeping with the current regime of a EEA and UK wide exhaustion. So as it was before um, uh, Brexit uh, and is currently right now on a temporary basis. So goods simply can move freely between the UK and the EU uh, one way, uh, but they can't come back from France into the UK um, without the rights holder being able to enforce their rights. Um, many are, uh, and you get a strong sense from the consultation document uh, that the government might be leaning this direction already. Um, I think uh, that was the uh, seemingly the, the outcome of a consultation or a study uh, done by Ernst & Young and commissioned by the government in 2019. Uh, that itself, that study had actually identified that um, parallel trade amounted for about 5 and 10% of UK trade in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, and and uh, clearly what attracted the government to this part of the, uh, to the part of the Ernst & Young study was that this had saved the NHS about 100 million pounds a year. Uh, there seems to be some enthusiasm, I suspect, therefore, to keep this current regime to allow that continued trade and allow the NHS to benefit from it. The alternative otherwise is to have uh, either international exhaustion, so the goods can freely move um, into the UK, even if they've been put on the market, say, in the, in the US or Australia or anywhere in the world, uh, and that's moving away from the Fortress Europe concept uh, completely. Uh, the next alternative is a purely national exhaustion regime, where the rights are only exhausted if the goods are put on the market with consent in the UK. And then uh, another one that's been mooted is, a, is the concept of a mixed regime, which is uh, where you have different regimes for different types of goods, perhaps, or for different intellectual property rights, trademarks, maybe patents, copyrights differently, or for certain sectors. Um, now, this idea uh, is certainly uh, in play at the moment in Switzerland, where for the pharmaceuticals, uh, there is one regime and for other goods, there's another regime. Uh, the feeling is this, uh, certainly the observation in the in the consultation document is that this could be very complex. Uh, uh, whether you do it by intellectual property right is not ideal because there are many goods that actually benefit from more than one intellectual property right protection. Uh, if you do it by goods, how do you define the goods? There's, there's lots of um, challenges in identifying clearly which goods might fall in and which might, goods might fall outside such a regime. If it was done perhaps by reference to um, 
uh, whether it's prescription only medicines or not, that might be doable. Uh, but um, there was many years of litigation um, uh, over wh whether a Jaffa cake was a Jaffa cake, was whether it was a cake or a biscuit. So you can just see the, uh, the, the potential for there being uh, years of litigation over how certain goods are defined or not defined as falling into this regime. So the, the government's already anticipating some, uh, some difficulties with coming up with a mixed, mixed regime. The fifth uh, option I, I was suggesting um, that hasn't uh, appeared in the government's consultation, but I don't yet see why uh, it might not work, is the idea of exhaustion in the UK and Ireland. Um, one of the difficulties that was uh, suggested uh, as to a national only exhaustion for the UK was the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, and the idea of therefore having some sort of barrier between uh, either Great Britain and Northern Ireland or between Northern Ireland and Ireland. But actually in the, con in the scenario uh, that I've suggested here, which is where goods are put on the market either in Ireland or the UK means the rights are exhausted in the UK, doesn't necessarily seem to fall foul of the Northern Ireland Protocol. I'm, I'm not so sure, and I don't hold myself out as an expert on the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, as a result, I've actually raised this with those who are running the consultation at the UK IPO, uh, and I await their response. I suggested this to them yesterday, and we'll see if this is something that could um, uh, run. If it is, uh, I happen to be involved directly in the consultation on behalf of MARCS, which is European Trademark Owners Association, and also the Law Society, the UK Law Society, on this consultation. So um, if this becomes a fifth alternative, that's something I think we'll be exploring with our members. Certainly, again, if the pharmaceutical industry thinks that's a viable option, that's something I think that would merit um, your input. Um, what did happen on Brexit is that we inherited, as you will know, the um, EU case law uh, that was current uh, as at the end of the transition period. Uh, and this arises from the European uh, from the Withdrawal Act. Um, and the consequences of this is that we have also adopted um, uh, the case law, the many years of case law arising in the world of uh, parallel imports and exhaustion of rights. Now, some of it is helpful, but uh, much of it is not necessarily so clear. Uh, and uh, the Court of Justice has managed to make, uh, some might say politely, a real dog's dinner of uh, some of the issues here. Um, and uh, the complexities that are arising out of that case law is something I think uh, industry would be keen to see not replicated in any new regime uh, that the UK government implements. And this, it, it, even if uh, the, the consultations um, that I'm going to be involved with on behalf of brand owners in particular and the Law Society, even if we are unable to come to a single um, position and recommend which one should be preferred, I know I'm fairly confident that we will all be keen to make an observation uh, and an invitation to the UK government to uh, try and add some clarity in this area that is very complex. Uh, I, here, I, I pick out three points on, under the, the, uh, the carve out that I mentioned of legitimate reasons where uh, many years of case law have evolved to uh, give rise to complexity. So we have the you know, difficulties over what is meant by something being put on the market. Uh, and we've got cases that say, well, there has to be an actual sale. Merely offering it for sale is not enough. Uh, but the idea and the concept is that the IP rights owner has realized some economic value from that process. That case law has been quite helpful. Uh, and again, on the right hand side, some of that case law has likewise been helpful, but the concept of consent remains pretty uh, open to interpretation still. Um, and so there have been interesting cases where it's been suggested that a, that a rights holder that, that sold a product with CE marking, the, 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 the European Union marking, safety marking, was not thereby um, held to have consented to the goods being sold in the in the European Union. So in that instance, it was sold outside the European Union, and yet the goods were marked with CE marks, and yet an importer was unable to rely on that as a basis for saying, well, they must have intended that these goods were for sale in the EEA market. Some might say that's a slightly strange outcome based on the facts of that particular case. It does mean, and that and many other cases have, have, have really suggested that whether or not consent has been given is often not easy to, um, to anticipate in, in some cases. And where the burden of proof lies, for example, is also um, quite difficult to ascertain, and it can shift from one side to the other, uh, depending on some of the basic facts. 
But the real complexity arises, particularly when it's the legitimate reasons and what are the legitimate reasons for the importer, uh, perhaps changing the nature of the, the, the goods and the packaging and rebranding and debranding and unboxing and reboxing. Uh, and those uh, uh, conditions, uh, uh, the, 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 there are a number of rules that have arisen in that context and, the, and they started life in a pharmaceutical case, which is the, the BMS case, BMS and Paranova. Um, and we have the five conditions that need to be satisfied. Now, subsequent to the BMS case, it's been held that this applies also to uh, medical devices. And indeed, it's also been used in other contexts altogether. There's been cases involving whiskey parallel imports where these points are still, still get debated. And they uh, give rise to a lot of uncertainty. So you know, to satisfy, uh, and the burden is on the importer to satisfy these, these tests. But to satisfy them can be hard for the importer uh, and equally quite hard for the rights owner to ascertain whether they've been satisfied or not. And this is an area where it is ripe for future litigation. There's been no end of litigation to date. The potential for more litigation is almost seemingly never ending. And you can see here, I've just painted a little picture of some of the points that arise in these sorts of cases. And I don't think I need to go into them in great detail. Um, but the point we, I, I'm trying to bring out from this is that in the consultation that we've got pending right now, we have the opportunity to invite the government to try to plug some of these gaps uh, and create a law that would be nice and clear and not uh, allow for future endless litigation trying to clarify some of these meanings. So coming straight on to the, the final steps, I think, uh, of, of this. Uh, of this presentation really is um, is just an, uh, to implore the uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, in particular because I think you will have the loudest voice in this uh, consultation uh, and it's the voice that I think the government is very keen to hear. Um, we do think that it would be really helpful if as many uh, industry players could put in submissions on this consultation as I say it closes on the 31st of August uh, we can make the link available to you. It's quite easy to find on the UK IPO website. Um, to date, uh, the Ernst & Young study conducted in 2019 really only came up with statistics uh, and data from the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, the government is very keen to, he to hear from other sectors. Uh, and as I said earlier, one uh, aspect of the um, this consultation will definitely be um, uh, the, the value that is saved by the NHS. Uh, and it seems that that already is uh, getting uh, a, a pretty sympathetic hearing from the UK government. So I do think the pharmaceutical sector would serve its interests well to, to, to get in its, um, its submissions on this. Uh, we will be talking to a number of clients in this area and certainly helping them with their submissions uh, where we can do so. Uh, and actually, there's a lot to be said for having the voice heard, not just by one a particular company, but via some of the organizations that will be representative of them. So, for example, Marks, uh, there will also be submissions I know coming in from INTA, the International Trademark Association, uh, and other industry bodies. Um, that brings us to the end of our session. If, if we have any questions, um, I will uh, see if we can handle them. <laughs>